In this lesson, we're going to take a look at how to define the continuity of a function by using a limit. We'll begin by taking a look at the idea of continuity and some intuitive explanations of how it works, and then we'll turn to how to link this up to what we already know about limits. So let's take a look at the idea of continuity. We can begin with what we might call an informal definition of continuity. You might have encountered something like this before, or the concept of a continuous function before. In fact, many of the functions that you're familiar with and that we've been studying up to this point are continuous. But when a function is discontinuous in some way, that's often an important part of its, or an important property of it, and an important part of understanding how the function works. Now, if you've seen continuity before in a previous math course, you probably got a kind of informal definition of it. In a pre-calculus textbook, for example, you might find this characterization of continuity. A function is continuous if we can draw its graph without picking our pencil up from the page. Now, that's fine as far as it goes. It gets at the idea of continuity. Basically, we, what we want to say here is that a function is continuous if in some sense its graph doesn't have any breaks. It's not a very satisfying definition mathematically, however. We're going to do better. We're going to come up with a definition that doesn't rely on claims about what we are able to do physically, whether we can draw something in a certain way or things like that. And we'll do this by using limits. Let's illustrate the idea of continuity here so we know what we're trying to do. So here are two function graphs. On the left, we have the graph of a function f. On the right, we have the graph of a function g. Now, again, to stick with this informal definition for the moment, notice that you can draw the graph of f without picking up your pencil. It's just a single straight line, and you can put your pencil down in one part of it and draw the whole thing by dragging it across the page. So we can say here to get started that f is a continuous function. But in order to draw the graph of G, you need to pick up your pencil because as you're drawing the graph, you're gonna hit those three points where the graph skips up to a point further up than where you would expect to be. So there's no way to draw that without picking your pencil up from the page. G then is, we can say, a discontinuous function. We want a way of characterizing these things in terms of limits. Here's another example of a discontinuous function. This is a piecewise analytical definition of a function. It's a fairly complicated looking one because it's got five pieces, although all the parts are relatively simple. Here's a graph of the function. And if you look at the piecewise definition in the graph, you can see how each piece of the definition corresponds to one of the other things in the graph. Now, notice in the graph, you can see that if we want to draw the graph, we need to pick our pencils up. At the very least, you're going to have to pick your pencil up when you get to where x equals 1 and when you get to where x equals 2. Now, what we're going to look at here is what's happening to the limits of the function near those values of x or as x approaches those two values, 1 and 2. This will take us into the idea of linking continuity to limits. There's a slightly larger image of the graph we were just looking at of that piecewise defined function. Now let's ask, what's the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x? Well, this limit doesn't exist. You can tell because notice the one-sided limits as x approaches 1 do not agree with each other. As you approach one from the left, you're getting closer and closer to where y equals zero. As you approach one from the right, you're getting closer and closer to where y equals one. So the one-sided limits don't agree, so the ordinary limit as x approaches one does not exist. How about where x equals two? What's the limit as x approaches two of f of x? It's one, because notice that as we move along the graph, getting closer and closer to where x equals two, we find that our y coordinates are getting closer and closer to where y equals one. But notice that f of two is equal to two. You can see that point up at two, two, and the open circle at two, one, telling us that f of two is equal to two. 
What we just saw allows us to give a precise limit definition of continuity. Basically, it's this. What we want to say here is that functions are discontinuous at places where the function value in question and the limit as we approach that don't agree with each other. So here is our precise definition of continuity. We'll say that a function f is continuous at a point where x equals c if this equation is true. The limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to f of c. So in other words, the limit as you approach a certain point on the function or on its graph has to be equal to where you actually get when you arrive there. Given this definition, we can identify a few different causes of discontinuity, a few different ways in which a function can be discontinuous. One of them is if the limit as x approaches c of f of x does not exist. If that left-hand side of that equation is undefined, it can't be equal to f of c. And then the function would be discontinuous where x equals c. The other possibility is that the limit exists but doesn't equal f of c. Let's look at an example to see how we can demonstrate that a function is continuous. Let's take this function here, the function defined by 2x squared minus 3x. We'll show that this function is continuous at the point where x equals 1. We'll start by considering the limit as x approaches 1 of the function. This is a limit we can find by substitution because the function we're working with is a polynomial function. So we'll substitute 1 in for x there. And that's equal to negative one. Now let's consider f of one. Well, to find f of one for a function like this, we again substitute, let x be equal to one, and we get negative one as well. So notice that in this case, the limit as x approaches one of the function is equal to f of one. Since those two things are equal to each other, we know that our function f is continuous at x equals 1. We do need to modify our definition of continuity slightly to deal with the situation where we're looking at an endpoint of a function's domain. In this case, we'll use the relevant one-sided limit because we can't use the ordinary limit. The function's not defined on one side of the point in question. So let's go back to this example. There's our graph of our piecewise defined function from earlier. Let's say we want to look at the function at x equals zero, and we want to know if our function is continuous where x equals zero. Well, the limit as x approaches zero, the ordinary or two-sided limit, is undefined. Because notice that the limit as x approaches zero from the left doesn't exist. The function's not do any, doing anything to the left of zero. But that's an endpoint of the function's domain. The function doesn't exist to the left of where x equals zero. To, so to establish continuity in this case, we will look only at the right-sided limit, or the right hand, the limit from the right, I should say. And if we look at the limit as x approaches zero from the right of f of x, we can see from the graph that that's equal to one, and that's equal to f of zero. We can see that the point zero, one is on the graph. So because that one-sided limit for a left endpoint, it's the right-hand limit, is equal to the value of the function there. This function is continuous at x equals 0. The same thing goes for our right-hand endpoint, where x equals 4. Here we'll look at the limit as x approaches 4 from the left, because our function is not defined to the right of 4. In this case, that limit is equal to 1. That's also the value of f of 4. And so our function is continuous, where x equals 4. So for these endpoint cases, we look at one-sided limits. For anything in between, we would look at the ordinary limit. And sometimes considering the one-sided limits might be relevant. We can also take our definition of continuity, which applies to particular points or particular x values, and generalize it. So what we just said earlier is that a function is continuous at a particular value of x or a particular point where x equals c if the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to f of c. 
but we can extend this to more general kinds of continuity. We can say that a function is continuous over an interval, that is for every value of x between a and b, maybe including a and b, maybe not, if it's continuous at every individual point in the interval. Or we can generalize a bit further and say that a function is continuous without any qualification if it's continuous at every point in its domain. So this transforms questions of continuity in general over a whole interval or over the whole domain to questions about continuity at individual points, which we can examine using our limit definition of continuity. Let's look at some examples of continuous functions. Most of the functions that you study in calculus are continuous. And by that, I mean continuous at every point in their domains. So polynomial functions are always continuous for every value of x. Rational functions are continuous. You need to be a little careful here because rational functions will be discontinuous at values of x that are not in their domains but at any value of x in the domain of the function, the function will be continuous. Exponential and logarithmic functions are both continuous at all values of x in their domains. The absolute value function is continuous. The sine and cosine functions are continuous. So lots and lots of familiar functions are continuous. Now in calculus, we will generally concentrate on looking at continuity at individual points. And what we'll be especially interested in is what happens to functions or their graphs at, that are at places where the function is discontinuous. So we won't look at that right now, but our next lesson will be devoted to the different ways in which this can happen and the different ways in which a function can be discontinuous at a point.